Welcome, and thank you for downloading Movement Christian Church's sermon podcast. Here at Movement, we are passionate about God's Word and helping each other move closer to God. Thank you for choosing to grow with us today. And now, here's our lead minister, Bobby Wallace. All right, so we are continuing our series, uh, Magic Words. One of the things I'm really excited about, we've had a lot of people working hard for the past couple of weeks trying to get our audio on our videos working, and they got it working today. So I just want to say thank you. Um, I, like I've told you all the past couple of weeks, the devil is in the details a lot of times trying to mess up things, but we know that we got a great message we want to share with you today, and I'm really thankful for that extra thing that's working right today. Um, I've been called a lot of names in my life, and uh, some of them I probably shouldn't stay from the stage right up here, but I've been called a lot of things, a lot of things, but I'm adding something to the list as of a couple of days ago. The new name that I'm going to be called some is Pops, all right, Pops. Um, here's why. Here's why. Let's see a picture real quick. Yep. Yep. I am officially a grandpa, man. Woo. I know. Yeah. And I know you're thinking, how can you be 25 years old and be a grandpa? Uh, yeah. All right. Male models just can pull that off. That's how it works. Um, <laughs> but this is Lillian Diana, uh, our daughter, Robin, her husband, Eric, had her uh, just the end of this past week, and she is, let me see if I can do the stats, six pounds, two ounces, 19 inches long, and doing great, and has lips to die for. Look at that little pouty lip. That is just something. Uh, Sherry is down there now. They're going home today from the hospital, and so she got down uh, Friday evening really late, Saturday morning technically, uh, and then we're going to go down and see them towards the end of the week and uh, get to meet this little lady. And so uh, I appreciate your prayers. Everything's going well, uh, but I'm excited about that. And uh, as we continue in this series, we are talking about magic words. We've been looking at the book of Romans in chapter 8 and looking at different words or ideas that we pull from chapter 8 that can really change our life if we allow the Holy Spirit to work through his word in that way. And, and so we talked about uh, freedom or being free. We've talked about empowered and, and the power of the Holy Spirit that we have. And today we got a different one. But before I get into it, I want to kind of set the scene a little bit. When I was uh, in elementary school, um, I started kindergarten. Back then, like now, your birthday, you know, there's like a certain time, a cutoff when you can start kindergarten, you know, depending on when your birthday is. Back then, it was really long, and it was like mid-October. And I have a very, uh, a, a birthday that's sort of late in the school year, early October, October 7th, if you know, keep that in mind. You know, just go ahead and put that away, do that with that what you will. Um, I'm a size uh, 2023 20, Chevy truck, uh, you know, if in my knees any ideas. Um, but anyway, so I was the youngest in my class from kindergarten through eighth grade. You know, I was, you know, four years old when I started kindergarten. It was mostly because I was a child prodigy. That's the main reason. Um, man, y'all didn't even laugh at that because that's hurtful. That's very hurtful. Um, but I started at four years old, had a couple months before, you know, I turned five in kindergarten. And, um, you know, I wasn't I wasn't overly small, but I was, you know, the youngest one. And so I remember one of the worst feelings that I ever had was like maybe, I don't know, second, third grade, something like that. We're out there for recess or for PE and we're playing kickball and they're choosing teams and the, the PE teacher chooses, you know, a couple of captains. They start picking teams and I got picked last. And I, I mean, I was stunned, man. I, I was just heartbroken. And some of y'all can relate to that. Maybe you've been picked last before. And it, it was a horrible, horrible, horrible feeling. You know, I was sitting there watching everybody else, you know, everybody else go. And it's like, really? Really? I'm last? So I get picked last. Well, fast forward a few years, you know, really quickly, you know, I, I caught up and I was one of the taller people in school, you know, or in my class anyway. Eventually, as you know, I got a little bit older and sort of just caught up with everybody and I developed into a pretty good athlete. So fast forward to seventh grade. I, see, I, my school was really tiny. There was literally like 120 or 50 people in our whole school, kindergarten through eighth grade. That's how big it was. Yeah, for real. So I'm in the same school, kindergarten through eighth grade. I get there to seventh grade, and we always do this basketball game at the end of the year, seventh grade basketball versus eighth grade. And so we just have this big thing. Everybody gets out of class and watches this basketball game. Well, my classmates, you know, chose me to be a starter in the seventh grade going against the eighth graders. Eighth graders always win, right? Well, guess what? Eighth graders didn't win this year. 
So I was the second leading scorer on my team. I had one of my good friends was a really, really good basketball player, and he got the, the most points for our team. I got the second most points, and we beat the eighth graders. Yeah! Yeah! I may or may not have peaked in life at that point, but that's, that's a whole other story. But I'm telling you, it went good from being picked last. It was a good feeling going from being picked last to, you know, being one of the first picks uh, later on in life. And, you know, the thing is, and the, the sad thing is, is that for most of my life, I've not been considered short. I'm six feet tall. That's a pretty, you know, the average height, I think, for a guy is around five, eight, or nine, I actually believe it or not. So I'm six foot tall. You know, it's pretty, pretty good height. And now I've got these dumb children that are taller than me. And... <laughs> everybody's like, you're short. I was like, I'm not short. I just live with a bunch of freaks. That's, that's all it is. And I'm just sorry. It's, I'm not bitter about it, but I am. Um, but it was a bad feeling being picked and chosen last. It, you know, there's something about being rejected. You know, and kickball is nothing, right? Kickball is nothing. Some of you guys can relate to just feeling really utterly rejected in a lot more serious stuff. It's a horrible feeling. It's a horrible feeling to think that somebody doesn't want you and doesn't choose you. And feeling unwanted follows people sometimes for their entire lives. I mean, here I am talking about a third grade kickball game, and things improved a lot after that, and I'm still thinking about it. But a lot of us, because of maybe rejection or feeling left out, a lot of us can take those feelings in us and transfer them to guess who? God. A lot of us can take those feelings of rejection and being chosen last and transfer them and put them on God. And we can struggle wondering if God really truly wants us. You know, I, I talk about it a lot and there's a reason for it because I still struggle with wondering if God can love me because I know me, I know my weaknesses, I know my flaws, I know my sins and my struggles and I can really struggle. I can tell you guys, God loves you, but there's a lot of times there's a nagging doubt in here and in here for me is that, yeah, that's true for y'all, but I don't know if it's true for me. And maybe that's bad. I shouldn't say that out loud, but I believe in being honest. And so I think a lot of us maybe struggle with that on some level. Does God really want us? But I really believe if we can start to understand our magic word for today, I really think it'll be a game changer. It's the word adopted. Adopted. You know, I believe there are three mindset shifts that can come upon you once you understand what it means to be adopted in the sense that God inspired Paul to write these words in Romans chapter 8. And the first shift is this. And this is a mindset shift that I hope you can start to develop if you haven't already done it. If you have, you need to help bring some people along in this. But if you don't, listen up really, really well. First is this. Shift from entitled to grateful. From entitled to grateful. You see, I think sometimes we have the idea that, you know, God chose us, but we feel like we are the uh, pick of the litter, so to speak, you know? And it's like, hey, God, of course, chose us. We're chosen first. Maybe in your life, you've been chosen first over and over and over again. And so you don't really have a hard time with the first part. But the problem is, is you cannot stay in that place of entitlement and feeling like, oh, I really should have been the first one chosen and still be healthy. you got to move from entitled to grateful. Look at Romans chapter 8. You can follow along in your Bible, Romans chapter 8. We're going to be starting in verse 12. The scripture, of course, will be on the screen. And uh, we're going to continue here. 8 verse 12 says, So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit... You put to death the deeds of the body. You will live. We've been talking about a lot of similar context, uh, concepts because we've been looking in basically Romans chapter 8 for this is our third week now. And I'm telling you, it's, it's, it can be difficult sometimes. It starts to overlap. But I believe, as we talked about in our second Peter series that we finished up just before this, is that we need to be reminded of these very important things. So I don't want you to tune me out because well, guess what? I hate to say this. But if you tune me out, I believe you're tuning out the Holy Spirit because we're reading God's Word. And so I want you to listen today, even if you've heard some of these concepts a lot over the past two or three weeks, I want you to listen today because maybe God is trying to tell you, He says, you are not 
uh, debtors to the flesh, but you are debtors to live to the Spirit. We've talked about that concept a lot. Here's what we, we've established so far. We've looked at Romans and we've seen the context, the greater context. And one of the things we've established very much is that if you take on the life of Christ in baptism, if that means you're in Christ, we've talked about that phrase a lot, right? In Christ. Say it with me. One, two, three. In Christ. In Christ you are debtors. Now, for some people, they're like, whoa, what, wait, what? You mean it's not unconditional? No, the scripture's very clear. Almost, I mean, I don't know a percentage. That's probably a really good study to do, but there's so many passages of scripture that are like if then statements. You know, if you do this, then you will receive this. It's over and over and over. There are so many conditional statements in Scripture. And one of the things that we have to wrap our minds around is that if we are in Christ, we are debtors. And you may be thinking, well, you know, I don't have to do anything. Most of the majority of the rest of the New Testament, the, the epistles are talking about you need to be faithful. Stay faithful. Don't go back to your old way of life. Keep pressing on. I mean, there's so many phrases that are used. We need to continue. Now, does that mean that we can earn our salvation? No, absolutely not. But if you... Listen to this. If you understand... If you understand what gift you have been given... It changes your entire mindset. But if you don't understand the gift, if it's just, yeah, I'm saved, mm, you don't understand. You don't understand the gift you've been given. You don't understand what you deserved. And so when we hear this understanding that is that we are debtors not to the flesh but to the spirit, to live according to the spirit. Here's a statement. It's simple, but I want you to ingrain it in your brain if you don't already have it. We owe God everything. Everything. Every thought, every moment, every breath, everything. Everything. We don't need to be thinking, what's the most I, or the least I can do and still be a Christian? We need to think, what do, what can I give up next so I can follow Jesus? I mean, if we understand the gift that we've been given, it's, there's no sense, there's no way that we could ever understand or think, oh man, I want a lesser Christianity or I want to live a lesser life for God. If we understand the gift, it's all His and it all belongs to Him and we are debtors to Him to live according to the Spirit, not the flesh. But many times, and myself included, I live as a debtor to the flesh and I believe that comes from the idea that you're entitled God, of course God would save me. I mean, look at, look at him. Look at her. They're horrible. Of course God would save me. And we get this entitled mindset. But if we're going to grow, if we're going to be mature, I'm, I'm here to tell you, and you can apply this in whatever area of life you want, but if you have a sense of entitlement, you are immature. You are immature. I don't care if it's in your public life. I don't care if it's in your, your spiritual life. If you have a sense of entitlement, you are an immature person. You really are. And that, that's hurtful because, man, that's a big idea nowadays is people think they're entitled to everything. But we need to understand that we are not, should not live entitled and think we deserve special treatment. We are called to lay everything on the line for God. We owe everything to God to live according to the Spirit. And it says very clearly, if you don't, you will what? You'll die. So you owe everything to live to the Spirit, not the flesh, because if you live by the Spirit, you will die. But if you put to death the deeds of the body through the Spirit or by the Spirit, you will live. So last week we, we said these ideas, and I want to bring them back to your mind. I, I know I don't need to remind you because you pay attention to everything I say. But we talked about the Spirit and being empowered by the Spirit. And there was three things we sort of left you with is don't quench the Spirit. You know, don't do things and put things into your life that are going to squash and sort of press down the spirit and not allow the spirit to to have control and sway in your life so don't quench the spirit don't starve the spirit make sure you're getting into god's word every single day 
every single day so that you can get deeper and more uh, strong in the faith and allow the Spirit to have control and then follow the Spirit where the Spirit may be leading you. Now, a lot of us, we might get to the point, you know, as we get a little more mature, we, we get to the point where we don't really do all the bad things we used to do, so we don't quench the Spirit that much. And then we might even get a really good, strong, like, Bible reading habit where we read God's Word even just a little bit every day. And so we're feeding the Spirit, but then where a lot of us get stuck is we don't continue to follow the Spirit. You know, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but years ago I talked about my church planning journey, how God finally sort of kicked me out of the boat to come here. I was preaching this sermon series that was based on, uh, it was an overview of the Bible. It's called The Story. I don't know if you remember ever hearing about that. And so I was, each week the text I was supposed to be preaching was laid out for me, but I still had to write the messages. And it's like every week the message kept saying things like, you need to get out of the boat. You need to walk by faith. You need to start doing things that are scary, things that are, you know, push you out of your comfort zone because if you look that's kind of the whole message of the scripture is to follow God wherever he leads and so I was preaching this and I was telling our people at the church I was at this amazing church I was saying this is God's calling you to get out of the boat and maybe this is how he's calling you this is how he's calling you I was laying all these things and then I realized that everything that I was telling them that they needed to think about was not really a challenge for me but I'm like I'm not exempt and so I started looking and I'm like God what is it you're calling me to do? And I had been running from planning a church for about 16 years. About 16 years I'd had this desire. And crazily enough, even way back when, it was Nightdale in my mind. God put that in my mind. And if you're listening, he will tell you where he wants you to go. He will call you where he wants you to follow. And man, it was scary. But I, I did at that point. He, he kicked me out of the boat. It was a scary situation. We had a church that we loved. It was a great ministry. I've told you before, you know, we had, you know, extra grandparents. Our, our, our grandparents were close by on both sides. And it was just a scary thing. But God was like, if you're going to follow me, you got to follow me. And we need to follow the Spirit. And here's the next shift that needs to happen. We go from entitled to grateful, and now we need to shift from fearful to free. Fearful to free. That's a shift that a lot of us don't make because I'm telling you what, our culture, our society, fear is a drug. And it is pumped into our bodies and our minds over and over and over again. And I mean, you can, you can think about this on all different levels, but fear is a powerful thing. And everything in our society wants us to be afraid because people who are fearful are easily controlled. And the devil knows that, the enemy knows that, so he wants you to be fearful, he doesn't want you to follow, he doesn't want you to do anything, so we've got to move, we've got to shift from fearful to free. And if you're understanding that you're adopted by God, that's one of the shifts that you're going to need to make, to move from fearful to free. Look at verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. There's a lot of stuff in there. There's a lot of power. We are led by the Spirit. We are sons of God. So we've been talking about that. You don't quench the Spirit, you feed the Spirit, and you follow the Spirit. So if you're led by the Spirit, then you are a child of God. You are an adopted child. 2 Timothy 1.7 has a very similar uh, message to this. It says this, for God gave us a spirit not of what? Fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. It says there in Romans 8, the, the previous passage, it says that we don't have a spirit of slavery and fear. And why is that important to recognize that? Why is it important? Because here's why I believe it's important. Because comp compulsion and fear do not equal love. Compulsion and fear do not equal love. Most of us understand that in an earthly relationship sense. If, if somebody is being held at gunpoint saying, okay, you're my, my wife or my husband, everybody that looks at that knows that's not love, right? Even though if the person on the other end of the gun is saying, yeah, I, I love you. Why? 
They're fearful and they're being compelled, right? They're being forced, whether they want to. And so everybody look on the outside, you think about it this way, like a hostage situation. I, I watch too many cop shows. You know, the bad guy is behind the door with the gun pointed at him and somebody goes to the door to check on the person. So they're standing there at their open door and they're talking to him. They can't see the bad guy that's got the weapon pointed at him. And they're like, is everything okay? And they've already rehearsed what's supposed to be said. And they're like, oh yeah, everything's okay. Everything's okay. You know, we don't see sometimes and we can be fooled into thinking that that's what love is. But we know honestly that compulsion and fear is not love. But sometimes we think that that's the way it should be with our relationship with God. You know, how many times have you heard, maybe even said it yourself, because I've been there and I've said it. God, why do you let these bad things happen? Because we have a choice to love or not love. We have a choice to obey or disobey. And anything else is compulsion and fear. And so if we want real love from God, we've got to take the other side of it. Is that there's an opportunity for people to accept that love. And then there's an opportunity for people to reject that love. And so we need to understand that compulsion and fear is not love. Fear isn't love. Compulsion isn't love. And here's the thing. Everybody, if I lost you, wake up. Many believers... Many believers live their entire lives being compelled and living fearful, not faithful. Many believers live their entire lives feeling compelled or fearful, not faithful. You're always feeling like, well, this is what I've got to do. This is what I've got to do. Or if I don't do this, God's not going to love me. And so I'm afraid. So I'm going to keep doing this thing, even though my heart's not in it. And that's why, you know, to use a biblical phrase, that's why many of among you are weak and sick. And many of some have even fallen asleep. Paul said, you know, because we are full of people who are either being compelled or, or fearful and they haven't understood that they are adopted and because of that they can move from fearful to free. I, I love that phrase that the spirit of adoption as sons. And, you know, adoption is a very common thing and one of the coolest things that we got to be a part of is is we helped a family raise funds to be able to adopt a child as a church family a few years ago early in the the life of our church and that's such a, a proud moment for me and I hope and pray we get to do that again and we understand that adoption is a beautiful and a wonderful thing but we miss a little bit when we only think about adoption as it's mentioned here in Romans chapter 8 in terms of 2023 you know We miss a little bit of the uh, understanding and the depth. And here's what I want you to understand. Roman adoption was a very unusual thing. And this is the idea, though, that Paul was writing because he's writing to who? The Romans. So he's writing to these very Roman-thinking people, and he's saying, you are adopted. And here's what he was meaning. One of the things I want you to understand first is that Romans were not always the best parents. You know, I know there are people in our society that are not good parents, but overall, the general consensus is you need to be a good parent. Sometimes we take it to the extreme where we make little gods out of our children. That's a whole other discussion. Wow, hit home on that one, boy. But the Romans wouldn't even accept all of their biological children. They had the opportunity and nobody thought ill of them if they just rejected or disowned their child because maybe they thought they were weak or they weren't smart enough or they weren't handsome enough or beautiful enough and they, you know, they didn't think they could carry on the family name that well or take over the family business or if they were in politics that they could ascend to the throne or the governorship or whatever. And so it was very common for a Roman citizen to reject and disown their child even at a later stage in life. And so when Paul writes that you have the spirit of adoptions, you have to understand this. This is so powerful. That Romans would often disown their biological children. And when they went to adopt, they would adopt sometimes almost adults if they thought that this person would make a good son or a daughter. If they thought this son would make a good ruler, they would adopt somebody from another family that actually loved their child. And many times the family would be like, okay, it's good. You can adopt them. But what they did was they went around looking for someone who had their spirit. The, the, the one doing the adopting would go and they'd look and they'd see this guy, this boy, and they'd think, man, this boy is a leader and I'm a leader. You know, this boy is, is generous and I'm generous. 
You know, this, this boy is fill in the blank and he say, I'm going to adopt this boy because he has my spirit. He looks like me. He acts like me. He talks like me. He thinks like me. This is the one that I've chosen. Some scholars have said that it, when you were adopted as a Roman, you could never ever be disowned from that point out. You could be disowned if you were a biological child, but you could not be disowned if you were adopted. And so I want you to understand when Paul was writing that you have the spirit of adoption, that means that God has looked at you because you've been obedient to the gospel. Like we said, in Romans chapter 6, you were baptized into Jesus. He looks at you. He sees his spirit in you. He said, this one is mine. And I choose him. I choose her. And I don't know about y'all, but that lights me up. I mean, that's I need to hear that is that God looks at me and says, he is mine, or she is mine. He looks at us and he says, this is my child. I would dare, I would dare to venture that he would even say something similar to what he said about Jesus. And we're going to get into why in just a moment. This is my beloved son or daughter with whom I am well pleased. God could say that about you. Because he chose you, he adopted you, and because of that, you can move from, from uh, fearful to free. And we need to wrap our minds around that. And then it says something at the end of that passage. It says, spirit, our spirit bears witness with our spirit. His spirit bears witness with our spirit. What does that mean? Well, we just said, if you're adopted by God, that means he looks and he sees the same spirit in you. So he needs to see things in you and me that change and look different than they used to. Do you see the fruit of the spirit in your life? Is there a change in us? And if there's a change in us, that means we are a child of God. Now, I don't want you to beat yourself up because some of you are like, I haven't changed at all. And so you, if you've changed at all, that means that you've got the spirit of God in you. But do you need to stay the same now? Answer is no, just in case you're wondering. No, you need to keep changing and allow the Spirit to work through you and produce the fruit in keeping with repentance. Well, there's one more shift. Shift from accepted to abounding. Now, here's, here's why I think this is important. Some of you understand all this, but a lot of us might have stopped at different settings. Some of us never got to the first shift, but some of you stopped at shift one. And then some of you stopped at shifting from fearful to, you know, faithful. And you're like, okay, I can do this. I'm, I'm free. I'm faithful. I can keep going. But then a lot of us really stop in just being accepted. And you may be thinking, well, what, what in the world? What? That's not a bad thing. Being accepted is a really good thing. And I believe it is too. But I think this is kind of where I fall into the trap a lot. Sometimes I feel like God has accepted me. Yeah, I'm going to go to heaven, but he's not real pleased with me. Does that make sense? Does that resonate with anybody? If it doesn't, I'm, I need to talk with you. <laughs> but we feel like God's like, okay, I saved you, but go sit in the corner. Go sit at the kids' table. <laughs> you, know? you can't sit at the big table at the banquet. You're at the kids' table, that little card table folded up with a broken leg. That's your seat. And some people say, oh, well, that's all I need. That's all. You never heard anybody. It's like an old gospel song. All I need is a little shack in the corner of glory or whatever, you know, something like that. And we think we're being humble, but that's not what God has promised us. That's not what God has promised us. And yeah, that would be better than anything on this earth, but that's not what God has promised us. And so many of us stop at just simply being accepted, but we can shift to abounding. And that might not sound like a real shift to you. And some of us can't relate to, you know, what we talked about in the beginning. You can't relate to feeling not chosen, all that sort of stuff. You've always felt accepted by God, or at least for a while now you've felt accepted by God. But that shift has to happen if you're going to really be okay with the idea of God accepting you. It's got to happen. Have you gone deeper? Look at verse 17. It says, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So just to back up for a second, the verse 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ Jesus. You see, you're not just accepted. You're not just a second class citizen. If you are in Christ, you are fully a child of God. I mean, somebody ought to be excited. That's right. 
an heir of God. You don't just get to be a part of the family now, and then when you know the father starts handing out the inheritance, you're left out. Oh, here you get a nickel. You get a full inheritance as a child of God. You are a co-heir with Christ. That's why I said earlier that I believe God will say the same thing about you. This is my beloved son or daughter with whom I am well pleased. Because when God looks at you, if you are in Christ, all he sees is the perfection of Jesus. He doesn't see your flaws. He doesn't see your failings. He doesn't see your shortcomings. He sees Jesus. And because of that, you can be forgiven and free. You are adopted. You are chosen. And you can move from just being accepted to abounding in the presence of God. Abundant life. Overflowing. Overflowing more than we could ever imagine. Provided. Provided we suffer with him to be glorified. Bobby, you had a good thing going, son. You had a good thing going. We were excited. We were pumped up. But what? We got to suffer? I would not have written that in there. I'm just being honest. Bobby, Holy Spirit, you probably had to remove the holy. But, you know, if I was writing, I would not have put that in there. But God is God, and I am not. And God is God, and you are not. And he said, you are a co-heir with Jesus providing that you suffer with Jesus. Now that's hard to wrap our minds around. You know, we established something a few moments ago, at least I hope you were in agreement with me. We established that love is not under compulsion. We established that love, you know, that is forced is not love at all. And so there's a choice there. And we need to understand if we have the spirit, we are heirs and we're going to receive so much more than we can imagine. So I want to draw your minds to this. If you have the Spirit, you will have suffering. But the reward is all surpassing. And that's what you've got to understand, and I've got to understand, is that if you have the Spirit, then you will have suffering. And so that's kind of a red flag. If you don't have any suffering at all in your life, then you might need to consider, do I have the Spirit? Because he says, if you have the Spirit, you will have suffering. But the good news is that the reward is all surpassing. All surpassing. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. Read along with me. This also is the Apostle Paul writing. He says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction. All right, hold up one second. This was written by a man who went to prison for the gospel. And he was in various types of prison. Sometimes it was house arrest, but sometimes it was a horrible situation. He was stoned to death and probably died all for the gospel. He got up and walked out. He was put in shackles. And I believe Stephen talked about a, a couple weeks ago about just how horrible the prison situation might have been when he, during a communion talk. But we talk about all these things. He suffered. He suffered. He suffered. And what did he say? These what? Light and momentary trials. So he has suffered greatly, but he calls them light and momentary. These light and momentary afflictions are preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison so no matter what you suffer for the cause of christ the reward is what all surpassing greater than anything that you've suffered anything that you can dream or imagine look at verse 18 as we look not to the things that are seen but the things that are unseen for the things that are seen are transient or temporary but the things that are unseen are eternal and so you and I if we are thinking that this life if it's not worth suffering to follow Jesus we're not looking at the right life this life that we live although it may seem like forever is just the blink of an eye and the trials that we go undergo in this life are just temporary they are transient they're just passing through but the glory the glory is forever and we need to embrace that and we need to start realizing that we are living in it right now in our spirit because when we were buried with christ at baptism we were raised to a new life our spirit was resurrected it's just waiting for our body to catch up y'all 
We're just waiting. It's just waiting for our body to catch up. And so we need to realize I'm not here. If I'm in pain, if my heart and my soul and my mind is in pain because of the gospel or just because life stinks, I'm not here. I'm with Jesus. And I'm suffering. I'm hopeful. All I want to do is be an arrow to heaven. I, you know, if I'm going to suffer, if I'm going to go through difficulty, I want to be an arrow to heaven that points people back to God. If you have the spirit, you will have suffering, but the reward is all surpassing. So here's what I want to do, and I'm almost done. You can count the fact that Wake County won't turn the air condition on until May. It's suffering. I know y'all hot. I see y'all fanning and all that kind of stuff. I, draw, I drew your attention to it. Some of y'all weren't even hot until I said something. <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's, here's how we're wrapping this up. In what areas do you need to shift your mindset? First, let me say this. If you are walking out of here saying, I'm glad they heard that sermon. You need to kick in the behind. Because this sermon is for all of us. I don't care who you are, where you are, how long you've been here. This sermon is for everybody because all of us have another move to take, another step to take. So what mind shift do you need to shift in? The first one, are you entitled and need to move to grateful? Maybe you need to start practicing being more generous. Maybe you need to start being more generous with your money, with your time, with whatever. But you start being more grateful for the fact that you're saved by grace and you don't deserve it, but God is good. Maybe you need to move from fearful to free. I bet there's a lot of people stuck in fearful. You know, I just don't know if I can trust God or do this or I'm going to stop being fearful. I'm going to start being free. And it will have to start with baby steps because most of us aren't going to just take this big leap. But if it's a big leap, go ahead and take it. If you're, if you're uh, willing to take it, move from fearful to free. Or maybe you need to move and shift your mindset from accepting, being accepted, to abounding. Maybe you've been stuck on just being satisfied with a little shack in the corner of glory. And you need to realize that you've already got a mansion being prepared. And you've already got a Savior that has changed everything. And the way that I want you to really answer this question for yourself, and, and you've got to decide maybe which shift you need to make, but the way that you need to really answer this is this next idea. How is Christ calling me to suffer with him? How is Christ calling me to suffer with him? It may be a small thing, it may be a big thing, but how is Christ calling you to suffer with him? Because we've already said what? That if you have the Spirit, you're going to suffer because you are joined with Christ. And that's what we need to understand. You'll never be able to truly suffer with Jesus until you understand that you are a co-heir with Jesus. And what I mean by that is this, you'll never be able to be okay at all with suffering unless you realize who you are. If you are just stuck in just barely getting by in your faith, or you are stuck in the fearful spot, or you are stuck in, you know, wherever spot you're stuck, you will never, ever be okay with suffering until you realize, I am a child of the one true king, and this world has no power over me, the enemy has no strength, he has nothing to say, anything he says about me is a lie, only what God says about me is true, until you realize that you'll never be okay with suffering. And I'm preaching to myself now, okay? I'm preaching to myself, but we'll never be okay with suffering until we truly understand that we're a co-heir with Jesus. You'll always struggle to truly follow until you understand who you are and whose you are. Until you understand who you are and whose you are, you're always going to struggle. And so the question is, what's awaiting you at the end of your life? You know if you're in Christ, there's more than you could ever imagine. I want to tell you a very quick story real quick. We're going to go to Ninos to Mexico this summer. We've taken a team before. It's a children's home outside of Mexico City. And the very first time I went, a long time ago, I met this teenage brother and sister that were there. And they had been there for about 14 out of their 18 years. They were like four and three years old when the brother and sister were brought to Ninos. And the reason they were finally brought was the government brought them by. And back then, that was very uncommon for the government to directly bring children to Ninos. But the reason they were so desperate, the government was, was because that this child, these children had been rescued for the third time because their mother was trying to drown them in the river for the third time.
The one that was supposed to love them. The one that was supposed to have accepted them was trying to drown them in a river for the third time, a precious four and three year old. And so the government brought them to a Christian organization and said, can you take these children? And they took these children and I got to meet this like 18 and 17 year old who were just so well adjusted and loved and accomplished and successful going to university and preparing for, for careers. And I got to meet them. And the only reason, the only reason is because they were chosen and adopted first by God, but secondly, by that organization. The, the theme verse uh, for the organization is from Psalms, and it says, Though my father and mother have rejected me, you have accepted me. And they have done that for hundreds of children. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus, when he accepts you, it takes place over everything, over any rejection, anything anybody's ever said about you. It changes everything. And so I leave you with this. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 29. It says, For in Christ... You are all sons of God through faith, for as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. When you're baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So if you want to be an heir with Jesus, the first thing you've got to do if you're not in Christ is to get in Christ. And he says right there, Paul says in Galatians, that if you want to be in Christ, you need to be baptized into Christ, covered by Jesus. So when God looks at you, who does he see? Jesus. So that may be your step today. That may be your first thing, to get in Christ so you can be adopted and chosen. Put on Jesus. Maybe today you've done that. So maybe today your step is one of those mindset shifts that you've got to make. Are you free? Are you chosen? Do you understand that you don't have to just simply be accepted, but you can live abounding? What shift do you need to make? We're going to stand. We're going to sing. I'll be right over here if you need to talk and pray. Thank you for listening to Movement Christian Church's sermon podcast. Want to learn more about us? You can do that by visiting our website at movementchristianchurch.com or on our app available on iOS and Android devices under Movement NC.